you recently published this with a couple other authors, uh, one of whom is Dr. Peter McCullough, who's been on a couple times, uh, another one of the, the dissenters, I would say, over the last couple of years. Um, I'm going to let people read it on the screen. And when we're on the other <laughs> platforms, I'll read it, all of it if, if we want to. Um, but I figured big picture, the, the, the topic of today is how these COVID vaccines, the mRNA vaccines may be affecting people's innate immune response. So let's, let's define the terms while we're on YouTube. We're not going to tell you what uh, the doctors found in this on YouTube. We're going to wait for the other the other platforms to do that, but we will define the terms. So let's start with what is an innate immune response or an innate your immune your innate immune system. What what is that? Well, that's the part of the immune system that is the first uh, attack on any kind of foreign invasion of any sort, either toxic chemical or a, or a virus or even a um, cancer. So it's the it's the body's a generic immune system that's able to go after things very effectively if it's strong. And if it's weak, it um, it can't. And so that's when you have to bring in the adaptive immune system, in which case you've got to produce the antibodies. That is what is the goal of the vaccines. The vaccines are, are going to produce a very strong antibody response, uh, ideally, uh, to the virus to protect you with the adaptive immune system. But you don't need the adaptive immune system at all if you have a strong innate immune system. And so uh, one of the problems in our country is that many people are suffering from a damage to their innate immune system by the chemicals that we're being exposed to. And one of those is glyphosate, which I've been very obsessed on. I have a book here, Toxic Legacy, how the weed killer glyphosate is destroying our health and the environment. I've been studying this chemical for almost a decade now, and uh, I, I really think it's, it's, it's Roundup. So it's, it's all over the environment. It's all over the food supply. People think it's safe, uh, and it's not. So... Um, if you want to know more about glyphosate, read my book, but I'm not going to be talking about that today. Oddly enough, glyphosate is one of those topics that you still can discuss on YouTube. Not, I'm not really quite sure, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And actually there were some questions that came in on locals about, uh, about that topic. So we, we actually do want to talk about that uh, down the road. So that's a topic of course that interests people. Make sure that you're watching on their other platforms as well. Okay. Let's go back uh, to, to the paper here. Um, what is a G quadruplex? Okay, those are really, really interesting. And I didn't even know about them until only recently. I got introduced to them through one of the co-authors of that paper, who's really done extensive research in that space. And they're, they're also called G4s. And they are actually a structure that's formed in RNA and in DNA uh, out of the sequence of the nucleotides that are in the, pro in the molecule. And, they, and this structure, structural form, this G4 structure, creates uh, gelled water around it. It gels the water. And it has a super important role in regulatory processes on protein expression. And it's really complex and um, difficult. And there are a lot of researchers that have gotten interested in this topic. And so lots of papers are coming out. And you can see from reading the papers that people don't really exactly understand. They know that they're really important because the, uh, the places where they occur are highly conserved. That means that mutations don't happen there because presumably that would really mess things up. So the critical control mechanism revolves around these G4s in interesting ways that we don't understand. Even the experts don't understand. So they're quite fascinating and, um, and sort of unpredictable what might happen if you mess them up. Okay. I think we have one more, one more term. Micro RNA. More, <laughs> what is micro RNA? We didn't do exosomes. We can do all three. Oh, we didn't do like. exosomes yet. Oh, sorry. Okay, my yeah, bad. Exosomes. <laughs> I hope those are not too controversial for YouTube. Yeah. What's an exosome? No, exosome should be okay. They're fascinating too. Uh, all of these things are really fascinating. The G G four is the exosomes and the micro RNAs. There's a huge research space, and one thing really nice is people can just search on the web and find answers. You know, the, you can really educate yourself in biology. Uh, just with a with a web interface, you know, finding all these papers and reading them. The exosomes are uh, are little uh, lipid particles that cells release, um, usually under stress, but not necessarily under stress. Cells release these exosomes, little lipid particles, into the circulation, and they can go everywhere else in the body. And other uh, cells pick them up. So it's actually like email. It's like a, a complete um, communication network among the cells, and they stick all kinds of interesting things into the exosomes. Um, that are sort of uh, communication messages. And, and so one of the things they stick in there are the miRNAs. That's that third term, the term, the microRNAs. They put actually, they put proteins, they put RNA, they put DNA, they put uh, 
you know, other things, but microRNAs are very interesting because those are short little sequences of RNA that are, uh, that are controlling elements. Um, they're, they're part of, I think they're part of what they would have classified as the junk in the past, the junk DNA, because they have the, the pieces of the DNA that code for the actual proteins, and then they have the rest of it. And the rest of it turns out to be a much bigger space. And when they started looking at DNA, they were quite surprised and stumped to see that so little of it actually coded for proteins. Everything else, you know, was, they called it junk, but of course it wasn't junk. And part of that junk is these microRNAs, which are incredibly important um, regulatory agents that can go in and actually stomp on a protein and make it stop being produced. It can control the production of specific proteins. And each microRNA, there's thousands of them, and each one has particular proteins that it can uh, suppress. So very, very interesting. These are all involved in the control of the expression of proteins, which of course proteins are the workhorses of the body. So it's, it's, uh, it's all of this regulatory process that um, makes everything move along the right way in the circumstances that the cell faces. How does a senior research scientist uh, for computer science and artificial intelligence at MIT get into this world? <laughs> it was a it was a kind of interesting path, and it really started way back in my youth when I got my degree at MIT in biology, and I loved biology. I was very excited to be at MIT in biology at that time. We had uh, Nobel Prize winners that I were my teachers. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, I had trouble with researching in the biology lab. I actually was in the biology graduate school for one year, and I realized that I really was very bad at um, at the experimental side of it. I was really bad at that. <laughs> like I. I just messed things up very easily. I, I couldn't really, uh, and I didn't enjoy it either. So I, I really kind of had a, a crisis point in my life when I realized I couldn't do biology. It was my goal, my lifetime goal, and I couldn't do it. So I basically dropped out of graduate school. And then after 10 years uh, having four, and giving birth to four kids, only three, I guess, I got the fourth one was born while I was in graduate school, but I went back to school and got my PhD in computer science. So it's kind of an interesting history. And in the meantime, I was working in computer science. So I got a job uh, writing code uh, at MIT Lincoln Labs um, in the interim while I was having the kids. And then I went back to school, got my PhD. So now I'm a computer scientist by training, but I do have that MIT uh, background in biology from the early days. And I think that was really important. We had a whole course on the Krebs cycle, the, the citric acid cycle, which is the uh, metabolism in the cell. So I really, and I, I, biochemistry was, of course, I loved. Most people hated it because it was so hard organic chemistry, you know, these kinds of courses, I, I really enjoyed them. So I like the science of biology, but I don't do well in the lab, uh, which is okay, because now I don't do any lab work, I just do reading and writing. And I, I love where I am now. I, I was I got interested in autism um, around 2007, 2008 timeframe, I saw the rates of autism were going up every year. And everyone was fine with that. Oh, yeah, we're just diagnosing it more. And I didn't think so. I thought there has to be something in the environment. That's when I got into eventually, I found glyphosate. Uh, roundup. And I think that's the primary cause of the epidemic that we face today. The autism rates have gone up again this year, even more than before. And uh, we didn't even hear about it. I suspect you didn't even know that. Every year they announce the rates, they go up again. It's not even news anymore. Oh yeah, we're just diagnosing it more. That's always the mantra. And uh, I, I, if you look at the trends and it keeps going the way it has, we're going to be in really big trouble uh, in another 10 years. We're going to have uh, tremendous issues with um, very high rates of autism among the children. And um, I'm okay. I'm going to rein ahead. you in for a second. I'm just going to rein you in on this topic just because I am bound. I'm hell bound, Dr. Senef, that this will be the one of the only YouTube videos where you will still live in perpetuity on YouTube. So hang on a second. Hold that thought. Let, let's go back to this for, for one second. Um, this specifically, I should say, and we're going to talk just a reminder, everybody, we're going to talk about this in depth live on Rockfin and Rumble. So please go over, make sure you have the links for those if you're watching on YouTube, because we're going to cut the stream soon. Um, you're looking at the VAERS database, okay? And are you, as, as a computer scientist, is your specialty in this regard compiling data, basically, and trying to see trends in the data? Is that why somebody like you would participate in a study like this? Uh, yes, I think absolutely. And, and certainly I was the one who gathered all that data. We have seven tables in here from the vaccine adverse event reporting system um, showing, you know, different kinds of conditions that are affected by by vaccines. Okay. Um, 
I guess one other one other big picture question before we get into this, uh, could you talk a little bit about your thoughts, generally speaking, on what it's been like to, without specifics yet, like I said, without specifics on on why um, why uh, you're you're concerned uh, and why you're speaking out about it, um, but generally speaking, what it's been like. As somebody who has been speaking out, has been one of the dissenters, as they call them, um, what, what's it been like for you uh, as a, at a major institution like MIT? Um, how are you still employed there? That's one big question I have for you. Uh, and and what do you think about the fact that, that scientists seem to... I, I'm seeing more and more, like as I scroll through Twitter, I'm starting to see more doctors and scientists speak up than I did a year ago or two years ago. So it's it seems like it's becoming a little bit less dangerous to push back on censorship. Um, but you know, there, I don't I don't know where that's going to end. I, I, however, you were starting to talk about this stuff early on, so you were one of the people who was just like flying under the under the radar until it got safe enough to be like the cool kid in the back of the classroom. That's, you know, calling out the teacher. Um, so, so what do you make of the last couple of years? What's it been like to do research like this? And, and what's it been like, especially as somebody who works at a mainstream uh, major university? MIT has been very, very good to me. I have to say um, they've been amazing. I've not really gotten any pushback from my boss. No one has told me to stop doing this. It's too risky. No one has stopped me. I have my funding comes from a, a computer company in Taiwan called Quanta Computers, and they've been awesome. They were funding me before I got into all this stuff. I was developing uh, dialogue interaction games, um, spoken dialogue interaction with a computer for a person trying to learn a foreign language. So the idea was you could be playing a card like Gin Rummy, a card game like Gin Rummy, and you'd have photo pictures on the cards of cats and dogs, and you had to be able to say the words in, in Chinese, and then you had to communicate to the system when it was your turn, you, you you told the system what to play and the system played the card for you. And it, when, it, when it was the computer's turn, it would state what it wanted to do and you had to play the card for the computer. So it was really an interesting way to practice language in a natural environment where you're talking, you know, communicating with the language skills that you're learning and using, uh, but communicating with the computer. Uh, so that was the kind of work I was doing. And um I got, as I said, I got interested in autism. I got worried about it. So I just basically the next year, I just pitched a different story. I said, now I'm going to do this instead of that. Um, and I was talking about looking at uh, environmental factors that might be causing autism, looking for correlations, looking for statistical trends in diseases, not just autism, but other diseases and looking for connections to see if I could connect the dots and figure out which chemicals are causing which disease. To what extent could I push that field forward? by studying the research literature and using the computer tools to help me analyze the research literature and then uh, writing papers. So that was, uh, they agreed to that and they've agreed to that every year since then. So it's really been wonderful that they've supported my work um, without hesitance um, every year so far, so. Okay, everyone, this is where it's gonna end. The party's gonna end on YouTube, I'm so sorry. Uh, we are going to be talking about the research that's on the screen right now about how the mRNA vaccines may be affecting innate immune suppression uh, or your innate immune system. And uh, we have defined the terms and we have talked about Dr. Senep and really the only thing we haven't talked about that we could with her here is like what she eats for breakfast. So I know that's not what people are here for. We're going to go to the other uh, platforms. I am on Rumble. We're live on Rumble. We are live on Rockfin. We are live with a chat uh, on Locals. It doesn't have the live video yet because it's hard to stream with a guest on Locals, but you can join my Locals community, like I was saying, and uh, become part of the editorial board, post questions ahead of time for interviews, all that good stuff. And I appreciate everybody who has uh, been watching on YouTube. But again, we just can't, we can't risk it. I want, I want her to live uh, at least in one video on YouTube. And we'll see. <laughs> Her name may be flagged, but we'll see. Here we go. You ready, Dr. Setup?